primarily today, but we are actually going to be looking at um, also a uh, artist from Cuba. And so we're going to be looking at how Mexican artists explore personal and cultural identity. So um, in Mexico, after the revolution, there was a um, explosion of primarily mural painting. So mural paintings would be like in the center image and this left image over here. They would be art placed on walls, um, mostly in public spaces. So it was a result of the Mexican Re Revolution of 1911 um, and a lot of the political and social turmoil that happened after that revolution. Um, a lot of the artworks had social commentary to them, where a lot of artists were making connections between the, the diverse gap in finances for the super rich and, the super, and then the super poor, um, and trying to um, show Mexican culture, um, Mexican identity, also really focusing on indigenous populations that existed in Mexico before the Spanish colonized it. So this is the work of Diego Rivera, and he took some time um, in his youth to study in Europe. Um, when you look at this painting by him, um, can you tell what style he was influenced by or what style he was painting in? It's very much synthetic cubism. And he did know a lot of the Cubists. He was friends with Picasso, or at least acquaintances with Picasso. But if you look at it really carefully, you can see a lot of imagery that is based on his Mexican heritage. You see the mountains and the volcanoes in the distance. You see the traditional fabrics. Um, you see guns of, of the revolution. You see cacti. And so he was incorporating his own heritage in his work. Um, he made a name for himself and traveled around the world painting murals. Um, some of them, um, most of them in Mexico, but some of them were in other places. This one was in Rockefeller Center in New York City. And so um, it was demolished. And if you look at this part of the mural, you might be able to figure out how or why it was demolished. Um, yep, that is Lenin right there. And so Rivera was a communist and the Rockefellers were a major um, wealthy American family, um, industrialists. And so, of course, they would not have thought too kindly of having a communist in their capitalist um, building. And so they demolished this um, mural while he was finishing it. Um, he's really known for his public art. Um, this is in the National Palace Courtyard where people would have access to it. Um, why would you place art in a public space? Seems like a silly question. Keep in mind that he's painting these murals for the people. He wanted the people to be able to see their heritage, see themselves in the artworks that he made. So he was very i um, interested in the plight and of the common everyday man. So if you notice in many of his paintings, he incorporates the historical past of Mexico. If you look in the background, um, you'll see sun god, right? You'll see Aztec gods, right? You'll see volcanoes. And then if you look up, you can see the people. So he was representing the heritage of the Aztecs of the Mexican people, you know, not starting their history with the Spanish colonization. Um, he has imagery of modern day Mexico in this other section. And so you can see that this part is kind of based on industrialization. And if you look really carefully at this close up with that green circle, that is Frida Kahlo. So that is the wife of Diego Rivera, who is also in our 250. Um, here's a painting that he did in the Ministry of Education. You can see how he's often making fun of the bourgeoisie 
um, the upper classes um, for their wasteful spending of money and that the true honor should be given to the, the revolutionaries and to the working class. Um, he did do a lot of canvas painting as well. And so here you can see that this is the flower gatherers, the tortilla makers, the revolutionaries, um, the cowboys. And so he was often painting images of the common everyday person in Mexico and trying to give them dignity. Um, he was very much influenced by Jato. Notice how this revolutionary who's been um, basically dragged from a horse um, naked, um, is, was influenced compositionally by Jato. So that leads us to a dream of a Sunday afternoon on the Amada Park. And um, he would have known of the Sunday afternoon on the island of Grand Jatte by Serra. And he painted this in the inside of a um, hotel that was right off of the, a major park in Mexico City. So a lot of the public would be able to enter into this area um, of the hotel and be able to see this really grandiose um, mural. So when we look at it, it's divided into sections and each section represents an element of Mexican history or Mexican culture. So we're gonna break this up into parts. Feel free to pause and jot down notes as you go. Okay. So this is basically the themes that are seen in this painting. There's theme, themes of conquest and colonization, right, on the left side, images of revolution, and modern day achievements. So we have some revolution on the right side as well. But those are the major themes in this entire painting. So the functionality of this mural, it represents conquest, colonization, revolution, and modern achievements. So here are the people on the left. Um, in your study guide, there is a handout or a section, I should say, um, that has a place for you to kind of identify who these different people are. So um, number one is Herman Cortez, the Spanish conqueror of the Mexican territories. Then we have number two, right? So over here on the very far edge, we have Fray Juan Zermargo. I apologize for mispronouncing that. The first Catholic Archbishop of Mexico. Uh, he established the Catholic Inquisition. So just like the Spanish Inquisition, he's not someone who had been super revered unless you were a super zealot person. Um, then we have Santa Anna, number three. And then we have Winfield Scott, who was an American general and the head of the troops that occupied Mexico City. So you can see that they're not just people that he's holding in high esteem. Some of these people would also be people that he would sort of condemn. If you look really closely at this section, you'll also notice Sora Awana is also included in this. Um, our image of her, right, as this nun, feminist, and writer that we have in our 250. So in the center, you're going to find a really fun sort of cast of characters. Um, we have number five here. We have Jose Marte, the father of the Cuban independence. So he would be someone that um, Rivera would have admired. We have Rivera as a child. So number six here is Rivera as a child. And he's hand in hand um, with number six, or I should say number eight here, which is Calavera Katrina. She's this skull um, woman here with this feather of boa that's a representative of the Quetzalcoatl um, serpent. And so they, it is placed by the artist um, here. And we'll talk about the artist in just a second. We also have holding the hands of the child, Diego Rivera. We have uh, Frida Kahlo, um, the painter, as well as the wife of the artist. So you can see at the top here um, in these panels, we also have uh, what some of these themes are in the center here. I forgot to mention that here as well, right? So in the first one, we have our Spanish conquest and colonization theme. 
And here we have contemporaries, the people who are fighting for independence. Um, so here we have um, our Mexican symbol. She was created by a very famous artist, uh, a printmaker, Posada. And so Posada was a pre-revolutionary war um, engraver. So he was a printmaker and he was very, very famous in Mexico. Um, we also in this section have Diaz, the dictator of Mexico, who ruled for 30 years before the revolution. He's kind of behind um, the flags and right next to the balloon. So here we have Posada's La Cavera del Catri Catriana. So you can see how she wears this feathered serpent. Um, it has like a snake sort of quality representative of like the um, flag of Mexico. And you can see how she has the skull, but she's you know dressed really, really nicely with like a feathered hat and so on. And here we have the artist. This is a really great close up of Rivera, Kalo, and Posada. So then on the right side, we have the workers and the, the, struggle, the struggle, and we have the future of Mexico. So we have a poor family in number 11, who, was ex, who is basically dreaming of better days. We have um, number 12, right? We have Juan Sanchez Arcanza, who was a revolutionary writer and journalist, so he'd be very influential. Um, we have revolutionary workers in number 13, and then we have the president of the republic, really um, high up there. And so I find it really interesting that he puts the people, the common everyday people, the revolutionaries in the forefront, and then he hides the leader kind of in the far back. Um, you can see how um, he really didn't trust people of great power. So here's some close-ups of the revolutionaries. So you can see that they're fairly realistic, but there's also a sense of stylization with it, um, kind of exaggerated features and so on. Great. So Diego Rivera um, was quite had quite a name for himself, and he was a very famous artist when he met the very young Frida Kahlo as she was an art student. Um, we're going to watch this little video right now that gives a little bit of information about um, their relationship as well as her history, and then we'll look at her art. We're not gonna watch this whole thing. We're only gonna watch the section about Frida. A part of the point in art helps us understand not only the artist, but also ourselves. Sorry. Modern art helps us understand not only the artist, but also ourselves. This video is called Art and Identity, a theme we will explore using three works. Since their marriage in 1929, Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo had been Mexico's most well-known couple. While Diego was a painter who was famous for his large murals, Frida was a painter who was famous for being his wife. But in 1938, Frida's paintings were starting to get attention. So she takes her first solo trip abroad. She has her first solo shows in Paris and London. Her style is unique. Was it Mexican folk art? Was it surrealism? When asked, Frida simply said, I paint my own reality. Picasso gives her earrings. The Louvre buys a painting. Both shows are a success. She returns home, divorces her husband Diego Rivera, and paints self-portrait with cropped hair. Her art had always been in response to her life. I would imagine that it would be a process that was sometimes very hard for her. She used her artistic process as sort of an outlet. She marries her love Diego Rivera, and she paints this. She divorces her love Diego Rivera, and she paints this. She was determined not to merely be the ex Mrs. Rivera. Diego had loved her long hair and her colorful dresses. Frida painted herself without either. She's seated in this chair with a pair of shears in one hand and a piece of her long hair in the other. She seemed to reveal a lot about herself as an artist. She was willing to kind of go to those places that not everybody is willing to go. In 1940, this is how Frida saw herself.
Um, they didn't allude to one of the reasons why she divorced him and cut her hair. Um, for a time, her sister was living with them and he slept with her sister. And so um, he had many affairs um, in their relationship. And so that was kind of the last straw for her. So she divorced him and um, kind of spiraled. Um, I have a, a, a movie that I recommend for students to watch, especially now since you have some time. Um, you might want to watch it. I'll, I'll have information in a little bit on it. So when you look at her style, um, what do you think her style is category, categorized as? When a lot of people look at her work, they see it very much as surrealism, right? But she's always incorporating elements of her life and her cultural heritage. So here we have a Mother Earth nursing a baby Frida, and she has an Olmec mask on. Um, Andre Breton said that she was a surrealist, but then Kalo said she was not. And the reason for that is because, like the video said, she painted images of her life, not her dreams. So surrealism is, you know, when you, excuse me, when I look at this painting, I do see a lot of surrealist elements to it. Um, it has um, this kind of beyond real sort of quality. We, uh, we know that her chest isn't opened up and there isn't a broken column in place of her spine. Um, there is a dreamlike quality. There's kind of that surrealist kind of barren landscape behind her, very much like Salvador Dali, um, could be based on her subconscious mind. Um, but she used um, surrealist tendencies to be more symbolic of what was actually taking place in her life. And so she um, had polio as a child, so she had a limp. And then when she was a teenager, she was in a trolley accident. So she was in Mexico City in a trolley. It had an accident. And then a part of the, uh, the vehicle pierced into her abdomen. And so for her entire life, she had back as well as reproductive issues. So she was never able to have children. So that barren landscape in the background might represent her barrenness, um, not being able to have children with her husband. Um, the broken column represents the back issues. And she was always in constant pain. So that idea that she is covered in um, thorns or um, nails would maybe represent that um, brokenness that she felt she had in her own body. Um, she marries Diego and um, they live a very eclectic life. She had a pet monkey that she often port um, um, portrayed herself with. Um, she used a lot of animals as symbols um, to represent, um, you know, religion as well as kind of like indigenous mysticism. Um, and that leads us to the free, the two Fridas, which is the image in the 250. So let's go ahead and look at the image. Let's just describe what we see. Obviously, there are two Fridas here, but if you pay really close attention to them, you'll notice that they are dressed differently. Um, even their skin color is different. And then notice how they are connected. How are they connected? So they're maybe obviously holding hands, right? But also you can see that their hearts are exposed and there, there's maybe an artery that's connected to the both of them, right? So they're connected through their heart. So of course, what does that symbolize? Right? That symbolizes their intention, their love, their emotional content. So how are the Fridas different? They're both different skin tones. So if you pay really close attention, the Frida on the left is very, very light and she's wearing Spanish colonial attire. If you look at her on the left, she's slightly darker in complexion and she's wearing kind of an indigenous um, sort of peasant dress. And so these two different sides kind of reveal a little bit about her history. Her mother was Mexican and her father was a European Jew immigrant. And so she would have lived in a, a kind of an upper class um, 
family, and she would have dressed in the clothing of colonials. So she would have looked very Spanish. She would have looked very European in her youth. And after she met Diego, he really loved her wearing um, what he called peasant dresses, colorful clothing. He loved that she would braid her hair and put things inside of it. And so um, that side over there on the right represents how he likes to see her, right? And so they're connected with their vein, they're connected with their arms, they're seated at the same bench. Right? So why is she portraying herself as two different people? How does it represent her personal and cultural identity? So like I said, before Diego, this is how she painted herself. So she painted herself um, in colonial dress. She is wearing maybe some um, indigenous inspired jewelry, but she you know, looked very um, European. And then after she met and fell in love with Diego, she would dress herself as if she was a native <clears throat> to Mexico, um, which she actually was because she was born there, but um, like more like the peasants would dress and then she would do her hair in the same sort of way. Um, in that side on the right, she's actually holding a little painting um, of a locket um, of a baby Diego or a child Diego in that locket. So this right side has really been seen as the side that loves him. Then the side on the left represents her European heritage. So she painted this painting of her family tree. Um, I saw this in Boston last year. And so it has her house compound in the center with a little baby Frida in the center of it. Then it has her parents and then her grandparents. And so it represents her European cultural heritage. So she's feeling like she's caught in the middle of two worlds. She's in the world of Diego and she's in the world of her family. But even within her family, she was in two worlds, right? She has her father who comes from Europe and her mother who um, is um, indigenous, but also um, even being indigenous, wanting to be more European, wanting to look more Spanish. And so there's often sort of some cultural ties or some cultural ambiguity and like, who do I belong to? Am I Mexican? Am I European? Am I Spanish? Am I Jewish? Like, what is my cultural identity? So she represents those different sides of herself. So when looking at this piece, it's not really considered, like she would never consider it to be surrealist. But when you look at it, you will see that there are a lot of surrealist tendencies to it. So what are the surrealist characteristics? Obviously, you would never, unless you were a twin, have a double of the same person, right? So that's kind of this dreamlike sort of quality to it. It has a rather ambiguous setting, right? That back wall, is it a wall or is it a sky? Is the ground dirt or is that the interior of a room? Is it a floor, right? Um, hopefully, no one would have an exposed heart. And then it's kind of unsettling in how she stares at the viewers. Um, here's another part um, that represents, or another painting that represents her life. Um, she had many back surgeries throughout her life. Um, she tried to have children. She had a lot of miscarriages. And so she was often representing um, in her works stories from her life. So her wearing her back braces, um, how she was in constant pain, her struggles. Um, here is a painting of Diego on her mind. And then there's a great um, Julie Taymor movie. Um, Julie Taymor is a director um, who does really fine art movies. And there's one from probably 10, 15 minutes ago, uh, years ago, of Sama Hayek um, and Molino, and it's called Frida. So if you can find it, you might want to watch it. It's very interesting. Um, it has a lot of surrealist characteristics to it. 
Um, there is a section really early on that's like a sex scene that's a little um, embarrassing. So you might not want to watch it with the entire family. Or at least fast forward through that section. Okay, the last artist that we're going to look at that is of Latino descent is Alfred Lamb. Alfredo Lamb, I should say. And who do you think he was inspired by? Um, he also was inspired by Cubism and Picasso, and you can tell from this photo, he actually knew Picasso. So the style of his work is often um, representative of symbolist color, um, like the guitarist by Picasso, um, as well as very Cubist in its style, showing multiple views, right? A frontal eye with a profile head, um, back body with a profile leg, right? So he's um, often using Cubist tendencies. But he's also inspired by surrealism, and Picasso would have been as well with a lot of his later works. Um, but this is not the super realistic style of Dali or Fricalo or Magritte. Instead, this is the biomorphic style of people like Moreau and Art who are not in our 250. So they have kind of this angular sort of geometric quality to the figures. You can still tell that they're kind of living beings. So that leads us to The Jungle by Alfredo Lamb. So looking at this work, how is it cubist? What are the cubist characteristics? And then what are the surrealist characteristics? For cubism, there's multiple views and shifting points of view. So with cubism, you're looking at an image from all different angles and all different vantage points. I don't know if I made that obvious enough when looking at some of our cubist works. So it's like you can see the front, the profile, three quarter, top, bottom, all at the same time. Um, and you can see that here in some of the facial um, elements um, of this creature, as well as the body and the leg. Um, there's a sort of fractured angular quality to it. He uses a rather limited palette. It's not quite like our analytical cubist painting by Brock, um, but it does have a lot of the same sort of colors and it's very shallow in depth. For surrealism, it has a juxtaposition of a rational imagery, a release of the subconscious mind, and it incorporates some of those biomorphic forms. So forms that feel human but aren't necessarily realistic. So still, once again, abstracted. So when you look at the, this painting of the jungle, um, there are some elements that represent um, uh, Lamb's Cuban culture, um, as well as his African culture and his Spanish colonial influences. And so let's go ahead and look at the painting a little bit more deeply. If you pay really close attention, the heads kind of look like masks. The masks come from Santorini, or San, yeah, Santorini. So Santorini is, um, Santeria, excuse me, is a, um, it was a religion um, that was a merging of African beliefs with Catholicism. And so uh, things like voodoo um, are often seen as coming from this. And so this would have been ideas that had come with the slaves from Africa and had blended with beliefs of Catholicism. So masks were often used as part of that religion. And then, of course, thinking about why Africans would come to Cuba, um, that leads us to other parts of the image. Um, that would be, of course, because of the slave trade. And so a lot of the creatures, as well as the backgrounds, look like sugarcane in this painting. Sugarcane was not native to Cuba, but it would have been cultivated. So it would have been brought to Cuba and cultivated by slave labor um, on the island. 